Would you turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, please? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We, we teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the Bible, and we find ourselves, we, we're in, here in 2 Corinthians. Did I say 1 Corinthians? I feel like I did. If, uh, we find ourselves in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and um, it's just a fantastic, the whole book is, is amazing. And, and as I've said several times, I think it's like a, a manual for ministry um, to keep a right attitude, right motivations, all of that. Because um, as Paul says in Ephesians, we're all ministers. We're all called into the ministry. It's not just those of us who might have a full-time job at it. It's, it's what every, every one of us is a missionary. We're, we're all in ministry. And in chapter 4, uh, we're kind of breaking, it's only 18 verses, but it really breaks down nicely into three sections. And so we're in the middle section of that today, and we're going to kind of pick up in verse 6 or 7. But just to set some context, the Apostle Paul has been comparing and contrasting for this church that he began. Now, several years have passed now since he began this church. Uh, Kevin is reminding me, if anybody needs a Bible, get your hand up. We'd love to have you follow along with us and, and read with us. Um, he's been comparing and contrasting the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. That's another word for covenant is testament. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Testament or the New Covenant. And what he does is he explains that um, the law of Moses, it had its glory. It had its purpose. It showed every single one of us that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what the law of Moses does. And it did it well. Uh, and the Old Covenant, he said, it had a good run, but its time is over. Its, its time is spent, and now it's not, not anymore about the glory of the Old Covenant. Now it's about this surpassing glory. Now it's about this glory of the New Covenant. And he says, we come to know, just kind of, again, trying to get some context here, we come to know the glory of God, which in the word glory is doxa, the weightiness, the substance, the reality of who God is. He says, we come to know that, that reality of God, he says here in the first part of chapter 4, in the face of Christ Jesus. The glory of God is found in Christ Jesus alone. Now, Jesus himself said in John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. Jesus says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the glory of, of God. I'm the weightiest, the substance. I'm the light of the world. And we, our world needs that light. Can we agree on that, that our world needs this light? We live in very, very dark days. Uh, the 2017, according to the World Health Organization, 300 million people around the world suffer from depression. 300 million. 70,000 people in the United States died by drug overdose. 88,000 people died from alcohol-related deaths last year. In 2018, 42 million babies were aborted. 373 people died in mass shootings. I could... Honestly, I could spend, and you guys know this, I could spend the rest of our time together here this morning talking about stats like this. But even if we don't know the stats, you guys already know we live in dark days. We live in a dark time. That's not a newsflash for, for any of us. We live in a dark world. But as we turn our eyes upon Jesus, as we behold Jesus, the light of the world, we too get to pass on that light. It's, it's kind of like the relationship of the sun and the moon. The moon generates no light of its own, but it's just a reflected light from the sun. And so as we behold Jesus, we too get to be a light of the world. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill uh, that cannot be hidden. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and, here's the purpose of it, glorify your Father in heaven. Now, here's the thing. We all know, we all agree, right, that the, the world is in a dark, dark place. It's really dark. 
And we all know that the darker something is, the more brilliant light is. If anybody have, have ever bought uh, jewelry or a diamond or an engagement ring or something, they didn't take that ring that you're checking out at, you know, K Jewelers or Jared's or, that's not Subway, that's an actual jewelry store. But um, you, they didn't take the, the jewelry and set it out on white or yellow felt. They set it out on black or navy blue or scarlet deep red because they want the jewelry to pop, to stand out, to really be brilliant. It has to be in contrast to its surroundings. So when Jesus says that we are the light of the world, he doesn't say you could be or you should be. This is the reality that you and I live in. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are the light of the world. You are are what stands in contrast to the darkness of the world. As you guys go out on the campus and to your jobs and to the store and just go upon your, your, your life in this dark world, there's little droplets of light. That's us. You are the light of the world. We, we are, are what is in contrast to the world. And so Paul says in verse 6, he says, it is God who, who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, as a reference back to creation, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, this, as I said, this is such an important book, such an important chapter, because one of the issues that we have today, I think, is that we think we have to solve the darkness problem in the world. We recognize there's a darkness problem, and we think, oh, we have to do it, but we, we can't. We can't solve in and of ourselves the darkness. The gospel can, but we, we think, oh, a few more laws, a little bit more legislation, that's what's going to fix the situation. But the gospel, the light, the glory of Jesus, is that's God's answer to the darkness of the world. We look to him, we behold him, and our lives go from darkness to light, and then we just shine his light. And so he, we illuminate who Jesus is, and, and we understand our need for him, we walk with him, we trust him, we follow him, and we too become light. And so the gospel of Jesus is what's important. That's what matters. That's why, again, just kind of getting some context, Paul said it in, in verse 2, to back up a little bit further, he says, that's why I don't go about in my own wit and craftiness. That's why he says we don't handle the word of God deceitfully because it's the new covenant that matters. It's this gospel of grace that matters. And any teachers, he would say, who bring you back to rules, back to the law of Moses, he says they're peddlers, they're deceivers. If they're bringing you back to something that has lesser glory, why, why would you want that? They're peddling. They have ulterior motives. The new covenant, though, he says it produces life. And remember in chapter 3, to go back a little bit further, he compared all these things. It brought life instead of death. It brought righteousness instead of condemnation. It brought hope. It brought encouragement. All of these things. And says, so Paul says, we don't alter the word of God. We don't preach and promote ourselves. What we do do is we proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, because that's where the glory is. That's where the power is. That is where the light our world needs is at. It's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. If you ever go to a church and you hear a service and Jesus isn't mentioned, it's missing the point. It's all about Jesus. And now what Paul is going to do is he's going to pivot and say, this is this ministry that is so incredible. This is what we get to, we get to participate in. We're a part of this. This is what I, he says, this is what we, we get to partner with God in this. The gospel of, uh, the, the good news of who Jesus is, God's answer to the darkness is powerful, he says, regardless of what you think of yourselves. Because it's not about the messenger. And sometimes we hold back, right? We, we're like, okay, Jesus says I'm the, I'm the light of the world, but, oh man, I don't know. And, and what he says is that the message is powerful, life-changing, despite who the messenger might be. So in, we looked at verses 1 through 6 as a block last week. That was a light in darkness. Now we're going to look at verses 7 to 15, a treasure in clay. 
And Paul explains with this incredible illustration of the relationship between the message and the messenger. He says in verse 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Paul uses this metaphor of an earthen vessel. Earthenware was, it was the most ordinary, cheap, everyday utensil that you could get. The, the only thing that would make it valuable was what was placed inside. You know, you can't just judge by an ordinary, it's, it's what's inside that really matters. You could have, you know, salt in one and you could fill one with dirt, you know, to put it in his context or, or just for us, for illustri- sake of illustration. I have this. We'd say, well, which one of these is, is more valuable? This, you know, I think I got it at Freddy's a couple years ago. It's a nice pot. But it just has a handkerchief inside of it. But this one, now the illustration breaks down a little bit because my wife made this. I'm like, oh, that's cute. How old were you? I'm like, oh, 16. Wow, okay. (laughs) It was cute until I knew that you were, wow. Um, But in this one, there's a hundred bucks in here. The value, it matters what is inside. And every believer, every single one of us that have placed it, our faith, our trust in Jesus Christ is the recipient of a priceless, an invaluable, you just cannot put a price tag on, a treasure. The message that we each have inside of us is the power, the life-changing power of the gospel just in earthen vessels. Wrap your mind just around that simple statement. What is in you can change someone's destiny from hell or to heaven? Now, earthen here, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. Earthen, it means from the earth, right? It's dirt. Vessel means container. And so if you have another translation, your translation might say clay pot or jars of clay. But I'm telling you, it could honestly just as easily be translated dirt bags, okay? Earthen, dirt, container. Hey, when I go to get my groceries, they ask me if I want a container, they ask me if I want a bag. So it could be dirt bags. Even the very best of us, the most noble, the most whatever, compared to the value of what's inside, we're dirt bags. We're clay pots. Because in us, this treasure, the power to change someone's eternal destiny now, we're the bearers of, of, of light, of the glory, of the gospel of God, of, of Jesus Christ, who said in verse 4, is the image of, of God. That is all in us. God could have used angels just broadcasting across the sky. He could have went to every single one of us and given us a personal revelation of who Jesus is. But he decided to reveal the treasure, the power, the glory, the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ through us, frail, fallen. Romans 9 and Jeremiah 18 call us lumps of clay. You know, Genesis 3, we're 19, we're made from the dust. That's, that's all we are. He chose to use us with this powerful message, dirt bags, to bring light to the world and deliver the power of eternal life. Why? Why would he do that? Well, he answers in this same verse, and and maybe to help wrap our minds around it, I will give you the Tad uh, Skepper version. The TSB says this, There is a prize in dirt bags so that it is obvious that the super extra effective awesomeness is from God. That's, that's why. So it's obvious. The gospel's loaded with power, and, and literally it's super abundantly is what the word means, that despite our deficiencies, despite my weaknesses and my issues and my problems of mine or yours, the emphasis isn't on that. The emphasis is meant to be what's on the inside. That's why it's a clay pot delivering the message. Because if an angel threw across, flew across the sky... Uh, shouting the, the gospel to you or came to you and woke you up in the middle of the night and said, you've got to believe in Jesus, we would put, 
we tend to, to gravitate towards that angelic being or that divine revelation. We, but the emphasis is meant to be on, on, the, on the message, on the power itself, on, on what's inside. We don't want to be distracted by something that's peripheral. Again, I think I mentioned the Mona Lisa a couple weeks ago. I'm not on a Mona Lisa kick. I don't know what the deal is. But I, you wouldn't put the Mona Lisa in a neon frame, right? It's like, boom, 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 boom. It's like, you're, you're distracting me from the point, from the main thing. And so he says, we have this treasure. We're lights of the world, yet we're just jars of clay. Verse 8, we're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. These words are so descriptive. Hard pressed, it carries the idea of, well, pressure, think of that. Uh, but it, it, it describes this action of when grapes are being squeezed to get every single drop of juice out of them. Paul says, that's what, that's what happens to us. It's, it's the word that relates to, uh, um, grammatically to, to, to trouble and tribulation. It speaks of an incredibly intense and prolonged pressure and trials. And Paul says, we are squeezed, but we don't have the life squeezed out of us. Even after all that squeezing, he says, we're perplexed, but not in despair. Here's, this is super fascinating. The hard pressed, it describes something external, and this is internal. Perplexed, is, it's, in the Greek, it's a compound word, meaning no way. There is just no way. It means to be at a loss, unable to explain things, disoriented by the situations that are outside of your control. There's, there's things that happened in your life, and you've had them, and I have too, where your reaction is, is no, no, no way, no. And Paul says, we've dealt with that. We've dealt with accidents and tragedies and challenges, but we're not in despair. As William Barclay put it, he says, we're at wit's end, but we're never at hope's end. We experience both this external pressure, external pressure, and this internal confusion, but it's not greater than the power of life that's inside of us. Verse 9, we're persecuted, but not forsaken. Persecuted, beaten up, beaten up physically, mentally, emotionally. It says we're struck down, but not destroyed. We're knocked down or not knocked out, is what it's saying. Or Rocky Balboa, that great theologian said, you and me, you know, I, what, what the, I don't know, that's not Rocky, I don't know. Gosh, I always try to do accents, and if I did it long enough, I would end up as an Australian. It's every single time, I don't know why. I don't even know why I try. Gosh, I just watched a Rocky movie, or a Stallone movie the other day, I should get this down. But Rocky Balboa said, you, me, Oh, nobody going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you get hit. It's about how hard you get hit and keep moving forward. Paul and Rocky saying the same thing here, right? <laughs> we're knocked down, but we're not knocked out. All these, and here's the thing, guys, right? We've, sing, we've sang this song, right? Someone sing it for me. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed, blessed. We've all sang that, right? But the apostle Paul here, these, this isn't theory to him. He's not just throwing out some spiritual platitudes like, oh, here, life's going to be tough. It's not rocky saying, oh, you just got to toughen up, man, and get back up and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Paul says, this is reality. This is the life I live. I've been perplexed. I've been pressured. I've been persecuted. I've been struck down. Verse 10, always, not sometimes, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That, I'll tell you what, in this little passage, the words that are really valuable, okay? Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. We hear about persecuted Christians, uh, you know, in the 1040 window, right, in, 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 the, in, the, in the largely Muslim world, and, and Christians are killed and persecuted. It's, it's the most persecuted faith today. 
And, but we, and we read this, that Paul's describing the life that he lived, pressed, and he's been perplexed, and, and he's been persecuted and struck down, and we think, oh, Paul, that really sucks. But, but it's like a light bulb for me to, to what he's explaining. This, he's not viewing that as negative. This is a positive and he's not being macabre or mor- morbid or anything like that. This is a declaration of triumph. Paul says, yeah, there, there is death, but there's also the life of Jesus. And what he's doing is he's speaking of the resurrection. He's willing, so to speak, to, let me just paraphrase this little verse. He's, he's willing to, to carry about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus because The resurrection life of Jesus is also going to be manifested or shown in his body. Paul Paul triumphantly says, despite this clay pot that gets dinged up and it's wearing out, there's something super abundantly powerful taking place. And all that cracking and dying that's taking place in in, in my life, in the life of a believer, he says it's almost as though the crucifixion is taking place in me. But so too, the life of Jesus is seen in us. Not only is it it like Jesus is being crucified in you, but there's also that resurrecting power of Jesus bringing something to life in me. Now, he basically says the same thing. He reiterates it in verse 11. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal or or dying flesh. The result of this, and I'm going to read this verse from the Amplified Translation. The Amplified Translation says this. So physical death is actively at work in us, but spiritual life is actively at work in you. Paul knew, again, it's not principle, it's not, he knew in reality that the spiritual life that the Corinthians were experiencing, the eternal life that they had now tasted of, was due in part to the fact that he risked his life to bring it to them. And now, verse 13, he says, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. And I'll tell you, this should be a model for every single one of us that call in the name of Jesus. I believe, therefore I spoke. But this is a quote from Psalm 116. Now, we don't have the time necessarily this morning. I encourage you to to go back and take a look at it. But Psalm 116 is the whole song is devoted to the Lord sustaining the author of it through, and these are words from Psalm 116, through pain, affliction, trouble, sorrow. Those are all words in Psalm 116. And Paul says, we have the same faith and the same attitude as the author of Psalm 116. He says, he said, I believe, therefore I speak. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing, verse 14, this is, there's a knowing, this is confident, there's knowingly, this is what we speak, because we know this reality, we have this faith, that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus, and will present us with you, note this, for all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. When the Hoover Dam was built, I had a slide for this, and I'm sorry about that, I can get it up there, but um, the Hoover Dam, how many of you guys have been to the Hoover Dam? Okay. This, I'm just totally, uh, this is just coming to me right now. How many of you guys have been to Vegas and not been to the Hoover Dam? Shame on you. Come on now. The Hoover Dam is pretty amazing. It was built between 1931 and 1936. Uh, a hundred people lost their lives in the building of the Hoover Dam. It's, and you get there and you can see how that would be possible. Now, the kind of the legend is that all the bodies are in the concrete, but... Uh, they, they say not, so okay, whatever. Um, but Hoover Dam, it's, it's remarkable. It created uh, Lake Mead, which is, uh, is, I don't know, it's like it's miles and miles long. And 
because of the dam, there's 250,000 acres now that have that could be irrigated. And literally, because of the dam, by the making of the dam, life was brought where there was no life. Now, to honor the men who died there, there's a monument in the wall at Hoover Dam that bears the names of the the men who lost their lives during the construction. And it reads, it's got a picture of a man coming up from the water with his arms outspread, and it says above the top, they died to make the desert bloom. Paul says all these things, everything I've endured. And we could go through a list, right, in Galatians, and we're going to get at one here in Second Corinthians in not too long. But he says all of these things that, that I've gone through, all the pain, the pressure, the pressure, the, the, the perplexing, the, the persecution, the being struck down, all of that, it's for your sake. It, it's, it's for you and the glory of God. It's so that you would experience grace and thanksgiving and, and, and it's all for the glory of God. Now, I'm not going to go any further today and, and I just want to focus, just kind of sum up this, this passage and I think the point of what, a little bit more of what Paul is trying to say. We all, if we follow the Lord, we all want to display the fruit of the Spirit. We want to use our gifts and talents, but it's important for us to remember, and I say remember because I think we can forget, is that we are not the treasure. We're the clay pots. You know, I was just, I I remember um, hearing this and it stuck with me. I used to read through the Gospels, and I'd read, you know, about what Jesus did and uh, healing the the lame man and not willing, you know, just totally willing to, excuse me, go and hang out with lepers and all that. And I'm like, man, that's incredible. I got to be willing to, like, go to the unlovable, you know, and do that. And there's a truth to that. But someone said, you need to read the Gospels like you're the blind man. You're the leper. You're the one that's broken and needs a touch from the Lord. And so it's important for us to remember that we're the clay pots. And the treasure is who Jesus is and what he's done for us. He is the hero of the story. It's not a denomination. It's not rules we follow. It's not how organized we can keep our life or how hard we work or how the standards that we have that our neighbors don't. Paul's point is, it's the treasure and what the treasure does that deserves the glory because it's the treasure that changes lives, not you and your hard work and your effort and your denomination and all those things. It's Jesus inside of you. So as as believers, when we experience these things, right? And we, we live in the real world. We're, I, just this week, man, I've talked to a couple guys that... But they're going through some stuff, right? We, we experience stuff. We can get pressed and perplexed and all of these things. But it's at, and this is what I really want you guys to get this morning, if you had kind of tuned out before this, that's when the truth of who God is and what he's doing in us is most clearly seen by the world. Because we're just the clay. We're not the treasure. It's when we get chipped It's when I've been cracked. It's when I'm broken that the light comes pouring out. Our message, if it's grabbed the hold of our life, if the Lord has touched us and and translated us from darkness into light and we've experienced the glory of God in the face of Jesus, then it's in our suffering that that message is going to speak the loudest. You guys remember, I'm sure most of you, the story of Gideon from Judges, Judges chapter 7. Gideon, I I really appreciate Gideon. He was a reluctant dude. I'm a nobody. My tribe's nobody. My clan's no. I'm nothing. You don't want me. But when God called him to deliver the Israelites from the hand of the Midianites uh, and said, you need to send out a a call to arms, 32,000 men answered the call. So we'll fight with you, Gideon. Yeah, we will. And, and we'll, we'll stand up against the 145,000 Midianites. 32,000 Israelites, 145,000 Midianites. 
Gideon said, I do not like these odds. Yikes. And God said, oh, well, we're on the same page. <laughs> I don't like those odds either. Because if you whoop, if you're 32,000, beat those 145,000, if you're victorious, you earthen vessels, you pots, you're going to take all the glory. Not, you're, it's not for you. And so, he says, I want you to tell anyone who's afraid, just go home. Well, 32,000 answered the call to fight them. I can't lose that many, right? 22,000 people said, adios, see ya, we're out. <laughs> we don't like those odds either, Gideon. Now the odds were 29 Midianites to every one Israelite. The Lord said, That's still too many. There's still a possibility where the earthen vessel might be taking some credit here, 29 to 1. And so the Lord says, I want you to go down to the water. And if you guys come on our Israel trip, 20, 21, keep that in mind, sign up on the interest sheet outside, out in the foyer. We'll, we'll visit this spot. But the Lord says, Gideon, I want you to take the men to this water, and I want you to separate them by how they're drinking. 9,700 of them just jumped right in the water and, and had their drink. 300 cupped the water and, and bent down and brought it to their mouth. And the Lord says, all right, there's your division. And he's like, oh, will you send away another 300? No, no, no. Send the 9,700 away. What? Now, you guys have ever figured this out, the ratios. Now it's one Israelite for every 475 Midianites. And the Lord says, now you'll know it's not about you. Now there's no way the clay pot is going to get the glory. And so, Gideon, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give every man a trumpet and a torch that's within a clay pot. Gideon then he positioned the men all around the hills surrounding the sleeping, sleeping Midianites that night. And he says, when I give you the signal, I want you to blow the trumpet and then break the pots and shout, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. That's exactly what happened. Gideon and his 300 men, 301 men, circled in, in the hills all around where the Midianites camped. They trumpeted their trumpets. They smashed their clay pots and they shouted. And instantly... Light shined from one end of the valley to the end of the valley. There's lights all over around that valley. Startled, what's going on? Hearing trumpets and crashing sounds and, and lights all across the hillsides. The, the Midianites, uh, they came from their tent, and it seemed like we're surrounded. We, we can't see. We just see the light on the hills. And in their confusion, in the dark, they began attacking one another. Now get this, here's where we, let's make some application from that. There was a huge victory that day because in the darkness, the enemy was confused and defeated by the light that shined from broken vessels. When the clay pots are broken, then nothing is holding the light back anymore. Or think of Mary's alabaster jar. No one in that room enjoyed and was blessed with the fragrance of what was inside until she broke the vessel that contained it. And sometimes, this is just the way it is in this dark world we live in, God's only way to pour out the fragrance of Christ inside of you is to break you as a vessel. This is what Paul is saying to the Corinthians. We have this light, this incredible, glorious light inside of earthen vessels. And when we're getting hammered on and crushed and smashed, that's when the light is seen most clearly. That's when the enemy is, is turned away. Sometimes we forget we're the clay pot, though. We forget that that brokenness is, is part of this. Now, the Lord doesn't forget we're clay pots. He's always aware. He says in Psalm 113, verse 14, uh, he knows our frame. He knows we're but dust. We're earthen. But oftentimes, again, we all do this, I think. It's just our pride. We act like we're the treasure. And so we, we work hard to impress one another, even in the church. 
we downplay our flaws, we emphasize our strengths, and all that's doing, another way to put that is we try to cover up the cracks. But when we do that, when we downplay our flaws and emphasize our natural strength, all that really does is distract from the treasure that's inside. We are to let this light shine that's in these earthen vessels through our cracks, through our flaws. When our weaknesses show, and we all have them, but when they show, people realize it's not the pot. I thought it was just the way that that guy kept a schedule or so diligent with getting up early in the morning and, and doing that. When our weaknesses show, people realize it's not the pot, it's not us, it's not the person that's significant. It's God's power within them to change lives. And so when we're sharing the gospel, I want to encourage you to let your guard down. Be open about your struggles, your hardships, your weaknesses. And it becomes much easier for others to see what God is doing. That he really is who he says he is, a savior. <laughs> I act like sometimes I don't need one. But when I let people know I do need a savior because I'm broken, I'm flawed, oh, that's when the light comes shining through. And so Paul, he not for an instant, and we'll keep discovering this as we go through Second Corinthians, he doesn't deny that we're going to have moments, every single one of us when we go through the ringer, but the Lord is never more obviously at work in us and through us when others have no other way to say, how are they getting through this? How are they dealing with that health issue, that employment issue, that relationship issue? How do they do it? When, it, when the only option is to point back to Jesus, that's, that's life-changing. That's, that's what can change someone's destination. And when we do that, our light, like the Israelites in the Valley of Jezreel, that light will shine all over the valley, all over Kittitas. There's a lot of cracks in this room. A lot of pressure, a lot of times that many of us have spent perplexed and struck down. And as pastor, I, I get to hear a lot of those. There's been lost relationships in this room, lost children, parents, challenges at work, challenges with health. My encouragement is let the light shine through those moments because it's then, it's when the, the cracks are, I'm not covering them up. I'm, here they are. That's when the glorious treasure can be seen. Amen? Okay, let's pray, and I'll have the, the worship team come back up.